dungeon. So uh, this is where Kentucky tries to keep me too, is down here in the dungeon. But um, I will tell you that I have enough material for eight hours. I mean, like we could go all day. I've got 45 minutes. I would be thrilled, and I always offer this up. We can make it, it, I was, like I said, a college football guy. I was the slowest defensive back in the Southeastern Conference. My five best friends were the starting O-linemen. So, like, my wedding, I look like a 12-year-old. Like, it, the wedding pictures are embarrassing. And so, um, we would go out to Perkins to eat an all-you-could-eat meal. It was called the Tremendous 12. It was, like, eight plates of food, and it was $3 on Thursday nights after 10 o'clock. I found out later, I think they just served all the leftover food from the week to all of the college students, and we ate it gladly, right? And so I'd get through four plates, and I'd be like feeling like a champ, and they'd have all eight done, right? And so, uh, but we all paid the same $3. We're all going to be in here 45 minutes. What you get out of this is however hungry you are for whatever you want. So what my question would be is, we can go, and we'll start down this journey, um, hopefully on the computer, if not, I and it just won't have sound, which will be fine because I can still run through a bunch of the ideas. Um, and then the other one is, um, uh, but I want you to take away what you need. So things that you're like triggered a thought, like, you know, like in the session, you're like, how did, how did you do this or what do you do here? Because honestly, that was a 30,000 foot view of what we do, right? We started the school on fire with three initiatives, three initiatives. It's now grown to about 100. Um, and so you may have lots of questions like, what does those exemplars, like what are your standards for innovation look like that you mandate at every grade? That's one that we get a lot. What does, how did you fund all of this? Because see what I didn't talk about up there is, we had two mobile devices in the whole district when I was hired. Two for 500 people. We now have 900 people in our district. We have 1,200 devices. We're one to one K-12. So in kindergarten and first grade they get um, iPads. And in second grade to 12th grade, they get a MacBook, right? Like, and you say, well, why Mac as opposed to Windows? Well, because honestly, we did the research and we need less technicians to fix them. We don't even run virus software. Like, you don't have to like Mac. My, my tech guy was a, totally opposed to Mac. Now, he runs Windows on his Mac machine. Like, the Mac hardware is so good that he has jailbroke it and he does Windows on the Mac. So, I mean, like... There's ways of doing stuff like that. So what we have found is those skills are very transferable for the kids, you know, in terms of like Windows, Macs, you know, whatever it is. Uh, looks like we've got magic happening, so that's awesome. Um, I will go ahead and uh, fire it up. See. Is there any sound? Or is that just the computer sound? Huh? Yeah. So it's fine, I, and I guess we could have used mine then. But um, what I will tell you is, as we start thinking about what innovation looks like, we've got to start thinking about the tough questions, and this starts to frame that, that look. We're not going to do videos because of sound. It'll be fine. I will tell you this. I did my dissertation for my doctorate on a really weird topic, all right? And so it was on personalizing learning, and it took me down a journey. I'm, we, like I said, we're diehard Disney folks. We love their spirit of creativity, of innovation, of, of design thinking, of problem solving. Like, we like all of that a lot, like more than we should. The top six or seven of us at the district are ate up with it. Well, I went and realized something that I didn't know at the time, and that is, how many people know the story of Celebration Florida? One? Two? Celebration Florida was the culmination of Walt Disney's real dream. So outside of entertainment, Walt Disney wanted to go and create a dream town, like a, a town he grew up in in Kansas, where the center of the dream town centered on the dream school. So he wanted to design a dream school and build a dream town and literally create like what he grew up in. Like that was his goal. He died obviously way before, you know, even Disney World opened. And so it was in the late 80s, early 90s that the Walt Disney Corporation said, see, Epcot was the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. That was his like, that Epcot was supposed to be the dream town, and they turned it into an amusement park and made a lot of money. So, like, that worked out. But they said, we want to still complete Walt's vision. So they owned all this swamp land in Florida, 10 minutes from Disney World, and, and what they did was they designed a town, right, from nothing. It was just totally from scratch. The little dot in the middle of the map, 
That is the highest, that's the K-12 school. So literally when you build a town from scratch, you get to put everything where you want to put it. And they said the most important feature of a town is that right there. I just saw a local realtor came by my office and he said, look at these research. This is true. I just saw it yesterday. So that's the reason why it's fresh. You may say, well, that's not appropriate. That's fine. I don't care. I don't work for any of you all. So, <laughs> so literally he was like, look at this. A family buying a home cares more about the quality of the school than if they buy the home within a block of a street. <laughs> now let that settle in. A family cares more about the quality of a school than the fact that there's a strip club within one block of their house. It was 80% of all people care more about the school. Give us a great school, buy a strip club, we'll take the great school, right? Like that, I thought that was pretty crazy, right? So uh, that's how important it is. They built an entire town around it. Well, you say, well, what was the idea? They went out and hired, because it's Disney, they hired Gardner, they hired Harvard, Stanford. They had all the most foremost thinkers of the early 90s. They got them together and they said, build us a dream school. Look at the elements of the dream school. Now realize, I'm already in year three of the school on fire before I discover this research, all right? And so Celebration High School, Celebration Schools, was based on these concepts. I'm going to read them to you, and it's a little light, so I'll come up here. Students would not be grouped by grade, but by level of mastery of material. Students would be housed in neighborhoods. There would be multiple teachers in each class instead of one. Teachers would be called learning leaders. Instruction would be tailored to individuals. Instruction would be interdisciplinary. Instruction would be project-based and not bound by time or class. New media and technology would replace textbooks, and there would be no homework. Instruction would consist of personalized learning plans that would solve a single problem or example in a single complex topic. Testing would not be standardized and there would be no traditional grading. Alternate assessments would be the norm. Students would track their progress and work and through electronic portfolios. The school would be founded on a set of core values that all students would strive to. Students would be treated as stakeholders and would be co-designers of instructional process with true student voice. Communication with parents would be through multiple platforms including email, web pages, phone calls, etc. They opened that school in 1996. In 1998, Walt Disney Corporation said, hey, state of Florida, we can't do this. Here it is. We're closing up shop. So they did that for two years. The world's, one of the world's wealthiest companies, known for creativity, innovation, personalization. Nobody does like a personalized experience in 40,000 people better than Disney. And in two years, they gave up. All right. So now I'm in year three of the school on fire. And every element of this plan is in our plan, right? Like, I didn't know it. I hadn't discovered this yet. And I read this and I thought, oh, crap, we're going to, like, if Disney couldn't do it, Eminence ain't doing it, right? And I got thinking about one of the quotes of Walt Disney. It says, times and conditions are rapidly changing, right? What couldn't be accomplished in 1996 can totally be accomplished in 2016. And you say, why? the advent of appropriate technology. Technology can make best practice. When you do, you saw the little graphic upstairs. It's the intersection of best practice and next practice. Best practice, formative assessment, quality questioning, all of that good stuff, that's still crucial to a great school, but it can only be accomplished at the highest potential with the intersection of next practice, right? And so that's kind of where we're coming from. Everybody knows that for your graduate profile, we started to talk about rethinking learning. You've got to not just think about the knowledge, but also the skills and dispositions that your students possess. You've got to think about how you build in those uh, critical elements that you care the most about in the 21st century learning outcomes that you desire. This is our exemplars that you heard me talk about that we mandate at Eminence. It's communicate, compete, collaborate, communicate, synthesize, persevere, innovate, and create. And we've created 24 standards for every grade level, right? I've never shown one of these to an outside group because we're in year one of implementation. We beta tested for three years with a different format and we've tweaked it to get here. We're very happy with here. Like here's the first time. The original beta version was not mandatory for all kids. It was elected. And then we just piled rewards on the kids that met the things, right? Like we'll just incentivize it so much that everybody will want to do it. Guess what we found out? You can incentivize it with a $1,000 bill and not every kid in your building is going to want to do it, right? So then I had to have the tough conversation with our board like, do you really value our eight critical attributes for every kid? Yes, we do. Then I need you to mandate that every kid do these things to pass the grade level and we're going to have to fail them if they don't, right? 
That's pretty crazy when you think about how hard the Common Core already is and we're a Common Core state. So now not only do they have to meet 80% competency of the standards for a year, they got to meet our exemplars also to pass. You say, well, how do you do that? We have three for every single grade, and there's one that's mandatory for every one of them for that class. It can be accomplished between 8 and 3 during the school day. One of them is mandatory for every single one of the substrands, right? That way, every kid gets to, ha they have to do a goal for communicate, they have to do a goal for create, they have to do a goal for innovate. Then the other two are reward based. If you get one more out of every one of the eight, you're a red level reward. You're a white, or a white level is, red level means you pass to the next class. A white means you've met one out of every one of them. If you're a blue, it's the highest level of honor eminence has, and that means you get this other big plethora of rewards, right? So you say, what does it look like? I bet somebody wants to see one of those. Yes? Yeah. Nobody does? Yeah. Okay. So, I, like I said, this is off the cuff, off the script, and I'm not, oh, I am on my computer. You ended up hooking me back up to my computer. I'm sorry. Um, so then let's look at, uh, let's go with, Let's start with like K. All right, so this is K. So like for the communicate piece, they have to add three uh, pieces to the writing portfolio. They have to create an oral and visual presentation for class or community. Um, they have to successfully complete the training for the EdHub tools and trainings per grade level. Um, they have to create a product for public sale. Um, they have to do the design thinking experiment for empathy. They have to meet a personal goal, that's under perseverance. Complete the wellness standards, the character ed. They have to participate in five hours of coding. They have to complete level two on robotics programming. They have to do a grade level synthesization task. They have to do community service hours, video conferencing, working in groups. And then there's other standards that are more academic based, right? So that is the K version. I showed the K version to somebody and what you don't know is some of those where it says like complete the character ed requirements. You see, well, the nice thing is that's one strand, but we have 20 things on that strand. So, see, we can sneak in a lot more than just the one, but for a parent, it just looks like one and it doesn't look overwhelming. And then we sneak in the rest of it on the back end. I had a superintendent look at me and they're like, well, those are not, that, that actually doesn't seem that strenuous for passing. I said, well, what are your extra requirements to pass kindergarten beyond just whatever it is normally? And he said, well, we don't have any. I was like, well, it was a lot harder than that. I mean, you know, like, like you know, you, it's at least a start, right? And, and so I guarantee you that kids in most schools don't have to pass coding, AutoCAD, 3D rendering in kindergarten, right? So, and so that's exciting for us. And kids, the things that we started out in fifth grade are now happening in K, right? They're now happening younger and younger and younger because the kids keep outperforming. Um, all right. So with that, um, you say, well, buddy, what does, what does it look like? We base our learning around the passions. We personalize it and prescribe it to every kid. So we base it on their interests, their goals, their career interests. It is that intersection of best and next. Now, do we have questions at this point of anything goes from the earlier today or what I've talked about so far? The harder the question, the better. I'll give you another chance at the end, but there's got to be something. You can even be a jerk. I'm good with it being a jerk. I can remember one jerk in one of my breakout sessions. I was at the National, I'll get you just a second. I was at the National School Board Association in Louisiana, National Convention. My children, my daughter presents with me quite a bit. She's a really backward, shy nine-year-old that's now a, a uh, starting to grow up 14-year-old. And she leads sessions on teacher tools, on how to implement technology in the classrooms. And um, What's really neat about it is she's been doing it for a little while. My six-year-old son, Blaze, that I talked about, he was six then. He was in first grade. He had moved on. He has a horrible speech impediment to the place where, like, I understand him and his mom understands him, but, like, not every – he's now the quarterback of his little elementary football team, and you sh it, the other team never knows when to go. Like, like it, <laughs> only our team understands Blaze. So um, Blaze was speaking, and he had made – it was the day of the UK National Championship game um, where we lost to UConn. And he had made a UK medallion that he had created in AutoCAD in first grade. And he had put UK on it, the letters UK. And this older gentleman, Blaze, is like, can I please talk? And I was like, yeah, tell everybody about that, that medallion. And Blaze stood up and he, he showed it off and said, I made it in Tinkercad. And um, this gentleman raised his hand and I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I'm not trying to be mean. But he goes, that just looks like a circle with two letters on it, and that doesn't look like it's very hard at all. 
And honestly, like, I was about to go from Dr. Barry to Daddy Barry, right? And there's a big difference from being a doctor and being a daddy. And I was about to be a daddy. Bible says lay hands on the sick. And I'm in Arkansas, it's safe to talk about the Bible. And so I go up north, I can't use that. But I'm just telling you, like, I'm joking. That was a joke. And so I was throwing, and Blaze looks up and he says, well, it's a little harder than that. He said, that, if I'd had it recorded, it'd, be worth, it'd go viral, right? He said, it, I had to start with a cylinder and flatten the cylinder to make this, the disc. And he said, then the UK uh, is half the ratio of the circle. He said, I had to keep it in proportion. He used proportion, cylinder, and ratio, and he was six in first grade. I'm a high school math teacher, right? I got teary eyes and just wanted to throw the and just Blake showed the power of hands-on learning right there in that moment. Go ahead. I was wondering, what is the class size? Class size is probably about 20 to 25 to 1 now. Um, you say, well, how'd you fund all this? Is that a question for anybody? Well, no outside grants, no outside monies. We did it totally ourselves. You say, well, how'd you do that? We spent our money differently, right? We were a dying district in dire needs of desperation, and I went to our teachers and I said, here's the deal. Here's the plan that I have. Who knows if the plan will work, but here's the plan. The plan is if you'll teach 35 kids for two years, I promise you that we will have the money to buy the stuff we need to give you the resources you need, and then the kids will come, and when they do come, class sizes will go down. We'll have double our budget. It will work. Fortunately, it did. So for two years, our rock star teachers taught 30 to 35 kids in rooms designed for 25, and they made it work with that vision in mind that I can do it. I'm going to say something controversial. I would rather have a classroom of 100 students in it with one master teacher. Give me an amazing teacher. I'll pay that person 100 grand to teach 100 kids as opposed to four average teachers with 25 kids. That's the power of a great teacher, right? So we almost did that. Like, I came so close because we were so desperate. I thought, well, I'm going to give all of our teachers what I make, right? Give them eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000, put them in there with 75 kids, give them an aid and say, go. Right? Like, you tell me what you need. We'll meet in the gym and the cafeteria and everywhere else. That's the power of awesome teachers. And I still believe in that model. I haven't had the need to do it now because our class sizes doubled. I mean, our enrollment doubled. Class sizes went down. Money came in because we're seek formula. We are get attendance-based money in Kentucky. So, um, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, that is our, we have, we, to give you ideas of our numbers, 70% free and reduced lunch. That number has gone down a little because we now have kids driving an hour and a half to come to school. If you can drive an hour and a half to come to school, you're probably of like the means to do so. So our poverty numbers look like they're decreasing. It's the same number of kids that's always been there in eminence. It's just that the rest of the population growing has made the, the free and reduced lunch go down. Um, we're about 40% minority students, which I taught in a school of 98% in inner city Louisville, loved is one of my favorite places um, so we're not as diverse as that obviously but for our area the county that we're in is a half a percent diverse it has a half of a percentage point and so for us at 40 percent is pr pretty diverse and then in terms of special ed populations probably about 12 percent of our population and then another weird one was we're about 18 percent homeless like we have an abnormally large homeless population and of course the definition of homeless isn't what i would think but it may be a kid living with a grandmother but but they have a home but it's not their home like they are homeless so it's about but that's still 18 percent is a lot we do. See, when you personalize learning, it's amazing what all you can get done in the room, right? If you're personalizing learning for every child, it doesn't matter race, color, socioeconomic. You're meeting them right where they're at and pushing them to the next level. I haven't shared this upstairs, but I'll share it down here and see if it resonates with anybody. I believe that we've created the achievement gap, and that's controversial and it's not scientific. I'm going to tell you from my perspective, because I don't work for state government, I work for eminent schools. In eminence, this is what I've seen. In Kentucky, we start standardized testing in third grade. Is that, is that, I think that's a national trend is, is a part of the waiver reallocation. But is that true for here, Arkansas, third grade? So in third grade, what is a third grade teacher going to do? They're going to cram third grade content because they're going to be held accountable for third grade, right? What happens when the kid goes fourth grade? Teacher's going to cram fourth grade content because the teacher's held accountable to fourth grade. The problem is not every kid in that class is ready for fourth grade content when they hit fourth grade. 
So then they have this gap of learning, right? So then we go to fifth grade. What are we going to do? We're going to cram fifth grade content down their throat in fifth grade. The problem is we've got kids that are missing a part of third grade and now missing a part of fourth grade. They're getting further and further behind, right? So at eminence, we take them right where they're at when, they get, when we get them. And we do a continual push towards 12th grade. And we're not bound by time or test. A lot of people say they're not bound by time, but the test still binds them, right? We are not bound by test. I went to our Board of Education. By this point, they trusted me a little bit. And I said, guys, we're going to be the worst elementary in Kentucky. Our elementary scores are going to plummet. I said, I think we've got the best elementary in the state, but we're not going to teach the test. And it's comparative data in Kentucky. Is that you guys, right? It's not how well my kids are growing. It's how well my kids do next to your kids, right? And so it's just this competition. Well, in elementary, the first year we launched our program, our elementary went to the fourth percentile. And, and literally, our board looks at me, and I thought, they're going to fire me. Right? They could fire me. There's people that have been fired for less than that, right? And they said, you're a genius. And I was like, oh, well, that's all it took, is fourth percentile. I mean, I, we were shooting for five, but we it was, it was settled for four. And so, um, but, but it, well, you know what it helped was we warned them it was coming. It's called the tur I call it the turbulence theory. When the pilot warns you that there's turbulence, right, you expect some buckle up, expect a big bump, boom, you get the big bump, and you're like, boy, thank you, pilot. You're driving down in this airplane, and they don't warn you, and you hit turbulence, and you go up in the air, you think you're dying, right? Because it's like, he didn't tell me. He didn't tell me. And I told him the turbulence was coming. So we end up getting in there with these kids. Our middle school was in the 50th percentile, and the high school was in 75th. Now we're in the 55th for elementary, we're in the 75th for middle, and we're in the top 5% for high schools. Our high school teachers are, are struggling the most to adapt. And you say, well, why is that? Because it's all comparative data, and by the time they get to our high school, they have no gaps in their learning. It's not how well the high school is doing, it's how well the elementary and middle are doing. See, and so I think it's the eliminator of the academic gap. And it doesn't matter, we've seen no, the only gap we struggle with is special education. That, that's still a gap. Other questions? Yes? Did you just dive into this as you were researching? Did you start at a certain level and move up? Or did you have like a year two planning before you ever start? Um. But, but that's really not true. That our assistant superintendent calls me Captain Jack. It just looks like there's no plan, but it just all kind of falls into place. And that's because of, of, of planning it out hard. We didn't plan for a year or two. But, we, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a well thought out plan. Doesn't mean everything went right. Um, we jumped in very, very quick. Um, huh? we, jumped, we started all grades on most of our initiatives. Remember, we only started with three. So two of the three of them went all K-12. And at the high school was where we couldn't afford devices for everybody. So we launched one-to-one -one and we launched early college at the high school. That was the only variant at the high school level. Um, now we've had 160 kids. Of that population, 80% are first-generation college students, uh, roughly. Um, and, and that's a hard number to get because most kids think that they're just because Uncle John went to college and, and he dropped out after a semester, that they're second generation, right? I count it, did the person go and graduate, right? Did they get a degree? And, and for most of them, that's a no. Um, and now we've, out of 150 kids five years later, we've only had one child drop out of college and that person lost their mother a week before school started. And that kid was a brilliant kid. He would have been fine. He joined the military instead. Uh, just couldn't handle college. Um, he, he transitioned fine, but he's our one dropout out of college. Yes? How did you get parents and on board? Great question. Great question, because this is all very weird to them, right? We have a non-college going population from poverty. How do you convince them that this is going to change things, right? Like, how do you convince them that, that having fun in school and engaged learning is going to change things? And I will tell you how we did it was we just went and started the initiative, and then we found student success stories and highlighted the fire out of what kids were doing, okay? Because parents were in a place of desperation. The actual population that I find that struggles the most with what I'm talking about is high-performing students of wealth, of means, because they have no reason to change. They have no reason to do anything different, right? So for our population, when their kids are connecting with people in other countries, 
when they're inventing things, when they're creating things, when they're getting college credit hours, when they're coming back here, when they're on the Wi-Fi bus and they're doing their content, when they're coming home with products that they've made. We have a vending machine in our front office that sells products that the students have made on the CNC machine, on the laser cutter. On, when they're coming into office to check out their kid and they see that, like, it's just different, right? And so then they're like, I want my, they'll fight for it. I mean, like, dude, I don't understand it, but my kid needs it, right? Like, that, my kid ain't the same kid. Um, and have we seen the stuff that's bad of technology? Yes. Technology is the great multiplier. Drop these in a classroom and great instruction becomes greater. Drop these in a classroom with bad instruction and bad instruction gets worse. If you have classroom management issues and you give every kid a device, classroom management got worse by a factor of about five. You got great teacher doing great things, you drop a classroom of, of these in there, now you got even better instruction. It's, it just, it's, I call it the great multiplier. Um, so honestly, it was the story of student success, which leads into this. And we only have, um, what time does this session end? Never. Two? Never. That's well, I appreciate it. I'm going to do this because I want to, but I'm going to take up five minutes instead of ten. It's a ten minute video. This is my daughter, Brooke, who couldn't be with us today because um, she, she is planning back home for a night of resiliency. We, remember me telling you about the passion projects? Teachers are doing them all the time. We believe in the Google 20% mindset where 80% uh, of your day is committed to your work and 20% is committed to your passion. And one of her passion projects is student resiliency. And she's hosting a night of student resiliency tomorrow night where they have dedicated the past three weeks. They have found hometown heroes and they've written poetry towards the hometown hero and they're honoring the hero. Then they've partnered with the tech ed and they've laser cut and hand designed their own awards to give to the people that night. Um, it, that's, that's why I need to be back tomorrow night. It's, uh, my daughter, I have some issues with my own health that I've overcome, and so she wanted to give me her resiliency award. And so I, I, I wanted to be in eminence. But with that, she screen captured this for showing just a five minute taste of some of the tools going on in eminent schools. And because it's only five minutes, um, I'll, I'll start it and we'll see. You may not. Hey everybody. You probably can't hear it. And I'm going to show you about 10 tech tools that you can use in the classroom that are... Can you hear it at all? The first tech tool is gatemeet.com. How many people are back channeling? This is called back channeling. It's an easy gateway into to applied tech. So when you get on today's meet, you'll have to create a room. That room will be given a link, and you give that link to anyone you want to join your conversation. This one's a little long. It includes a video, but it's called Made with Code. I'm going to just kind of go forward a little bit. Uh, by the way, a lot of people say, how did you get 100 Web 2.0 tools embedded in your school? administrators started modeling it a year in advance. Like in all of our staff meetings, we had flip staff meetings. We had, you know, we started modeling it. So I love Screencast-O-Matic is a tool that How many people have seen clickers? If you have, a lot of you have, you need to, clickers is one of the best free formative assessments on the market. Formative assessment, and it's a quick way to know the audience's or class's answers. So please don't get clickers in a classroom confused with pickers in a classroom because that's just disgusting. <laughs> Middle school humor. Clickers is an app, and this is what your device would look like after you downloaded the app. So you just scan the audiences or Grades it, gives you instant feedback, look at your device. I'm trying to create a way for virtual reality. I've invented the Coco app. Um, I've never shown that to a group. Would anybody be interested in the competency collector that we've created? Like, I'd love feedback on it. I'll try to throw that up here next. So anyway, if, if you all wanted to see that. Um, Brooke, has, Brooke started out, um, we, she was nine years old, third grade. We, put, we bought every teacher a device November the 9th of uh, 2011 
and we knew we were going one to one nine months later with the kids because we were on such a fast scale of implementation. I knew the teachers better have it before kids or it was going to fail. The problem was we believe in fun and not forcing people to do stuff. We call it the fun theory. And the problem was two months later only five of our teachers, five percent of our teachers were using the devices on a daily basis. So we had this moral dilemma like how do we make them do it, right? And so what we ended up doing was um, Brooke taught herself Keynote and she over Christmas break made me one. It was my computer sitting at home in a corner because I didn't want to switch to a Mac because I had a Windows machine. And so she comes over and says, I made a presentation for you. And I was like, who taught you how to do that? And she goes, I just kept playing with it until I figured it out. Spirit of innovation, right? Kids just play with stuff until they master it. I said, can you teach other people how to do that? She said, probably. I said, you're leading a three hour PD for our entire staff in, in a month. Most shy backwards nine year old on earth. She led a three hour PD training and within 10 business days, 87% of our teachers were using the devices on a daily basis. I said, why? And they said, because she talked in, a, in our, perspe our perspective we could understand. Drag this, drop it here, right? Click this and put this here. Like it wasn't fancy tech talk. Well now Brooke has spoke probably to 20,000 people. She leads PDs on how to implement technology into the classroom. She's 14 years old. She's far more knowledgeable about apps. About a year and a half to two years ago, she said, Daddy, I'm telling people about this, but nobody in my class does this. Right? That's, hey, that's, that, that's, that's hard to hear, right? And I said, sweetheart, keep talking about it because it's coming. A year later comes by and she goes, Daddy, you know what? Every kid in every one of my classes knows how to do everything that I talk about. See, what Brooke had described was, was systemic change. The, the school had radically transformed around her, and, and it was speaking that vision into it. Um, look up this. We don't have time today. That is, we call it the fun theory. Type in fun theory in YouTube and you will see about 50 videos that are just awesome at tr how you force people to do things that they don't want to do through fun, right? And we've based almost everything we've done off of that and it works, like it does work. It's not always easy, um, but it does work. Um, I talked about the 20% time and we don't have time to do that. Some of you wanted to see the Coco app and I'm going to try to do it via this and we will see if it'll work. I'm sure trying to do it will mean that it won't work. All right, come on and load. Oh, there it is. So this is the obvious, well, thank you. Thank you for that. This is the web version of it, but you can kind of see what it does. Uh, so I'm logged in as a teacher. This is made for iPads, iPhones, smart devices, Android devices. And so each teacher would have one. You say, okay, I'm going to create an option. By the way, I, I'll blow this up. Um, feedback's great. If you hate it, don't tell me. If you like it, tell me. If you have things to tweak, that'd be fine. Because um, we've invested about 18 months into making it, right? So this is what the screen would look like for them. And I'm a teacher. I want to capture the student learning. I want to make sure that I have captured that they've met the competency. And, and this is to create ways beyond standardized testing. You could still use standardized tests. Let's say you give a test to determine that the kid's competent. Then you would upload the test. The test would be your evidence, right? And there's ways to do that, and you'll see how. Um, but if I'm doing it on the fly, the kid's doing a presentation, they're doing a speech, they're doing a project, right? So I click on language arts. Um, let's say that I'm doing this for third grade. And this is going to be a little not as good. I pick the standard. Shows what the standard is. I say start the observation. I go and pick which class it is. And this all when the internet's cracking. It's a little slower when I'm on the hotel internet. You pick the student. And you have different, you can upload a document, right? To, if, you have the, if you have a test that you're uploading or an image. But if you're going to do it live, you click the live tab. I'm on my computer so I can only upload. Like if I was on my device, I would just use the capture with the camera. So I go to the picture. I click on whatever picture it is. That one's too big. Um, and I literally go and say, let's go with that. Uh, I click it. It's going to then upload it to the, um, I think I clicked the wrong thing. Let's just do this one. Choose it. 
That one's smaller, so maybe it'll work. And then it'll give me, it says there's the evidence. It says does it meet the standard, does it not meet the standard? Well, my delta thing does not, so I'm going to click doesn't meet. I'm going to click submit the evaluation. That process takes about 15 seconds when you know what you're doing. I've now uploaded it. Then there's a student dashboard, teacher dashboard, parent dashboard where I get to see for third grade English which standards have met competency. It's static. I mean, it's not static. It's fluid by live real time. And so then I can look at it and it'll say, this kid has met 100% of the standards covered. And then it's got a different number that says, well, that's only 20% of the standards for the year. And then you can click on those standards to do a deep dive and actually see the evidence that the teachers use to say that they met the competencies. We did this based off the fun theory. You say, well, what makes it competent or not? I don't care. That's up to your teachers. That's up to you, right? But what happens is when they go to fourth grade and the fourth grade teacher says, that kid doesn't know how to do that. Let me see what competency they chose in third grade to say that it met it. And the teacher goes, well, that doesn't meet that. Now they can have dialogue with each other to say, well, the thing that you did to create the competency, we really don't think is. And now in the PLC, they can fine tune that process for the next year. It's a way to try to create a, a, a focus on competency and, and, and having some accountability where we can work together and not mandate it and just force it. That's that. We have time for like two questions. This has been a kind of an odd session, so if it's not the best, I apologize. So you've blended a lot of technology into what you do. Do you use any sort of LMS or anything like that to cover some of the standards? We use Haiku. Um, it was the cheapest, best for us. One of the few things we pay for. Um, and we do. We have an LMS K-12. It's called Haiku. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. We, that's just the best one we found for the price that aligned to our vision and goal. Um, uh, and then on this, as we start to wrap up today, um, uh, I will, let me say this because I want to. And then we'll, we'll, we'll kind of wrap up. We created the Wi-Fi but the one problem that I could not solve in the seven years that I was superintendent was how do I get internet to the homes of our families that don't have internet? That we have a lot of poverty. And I fought with E-Rate for literally years over it, like years, and they just would not budge. And I said, I don't want more internet. I want the internet that's sitting dormant at my school. I want to broadcast it out at nighttime and I'll pay for all of it. Like I'll pay for the thing that I got to create to shoot it to our town and only our students are going to use it on our devices. Like, it, like why can't I use my school internet 24 hours a day? And they said, well, you can as long as it's on site. You can't broadcast it. And I said, well, <laughs> okay. And, you know, E-Rate still did give us enough money that it was, like, worth not being a jerk, you know. So it was like, how do you solve it? <laughs> so yes and thinking is what did this. Last year, it hit me, nobody can tell me where to park the Wi-Fi school buses. So literally, we now drive the Wi-Fi school buses into the biggest areas of poverty in our town, and the buses are literally parked in, in the housing projects, and we park them right outside the clubhouse, and if your apartment doesn't reach the internet, you can go in the clubhouse all night long, it's open 24 hours a day, and you have internet, right? Pretty cool. That was a yes and solution, right? That, that is the, the, the not taking no for an answer. Um, as we close, a lot of people say uh, this, they say, where do I start? Like, where do I start with all of this? I will tell you where it started for us. Literally, I was in a really boring PD, and I looked at our instructional supervisor, who's now our assistant superintendent. He's a good friend of mine, probably my best friend. And he, I say he drank the Kool-Aid before there was sugar in it, right? Like, he was, he was the first guy on board. And I said, do you think this could work? And I had three random ideas that started it all. I now have that framed in my office. And he looked at me, and I've always wondered what I would have done if he had said no. You know, but he said, yes, that can work. Um, and so for us, it literally started uh, on a napkin. And so um, you need to just get that idea. Like whatever your idea is, get your napkin idea, right? This summer, did anybody see this where they found a blue lobster in Boston? Raise your hand if you saw that story. You know what inspired me about this is that they said it was one in two million odds that you would catch a blue lobster. This is what he looks like. I mean, just magnificent, especially for a UK Wildcat fan, right? God, God said, we're going to make the rarest of all lobsters blue. That just feels right. And so um, um, what I was thinking about, we need something. We've got UK football. We, we need a lobster. You know, we've got to have something to hang our hat on. And so 
I want you to go out and think of a blue lobster idea, like a one in two million idea, something that will blow the minds of your school, of your community. Start with one crazy idea and really try to pull it off. Uh, it reminds me of this story of a king. This king had a daughter, and she was going to inherit the entire kingdom, but he had to find a, a husband. And so he said he lined up all of the bravest, most handsome men in the, in the, in the country, and he put between them a half-mile swamp of alligators, of, of piranhas, of snakes, of barbs, of wires, and sharp rock. And he said, the first one to get to me gets to marry my daughter and will eventually be the king of the kingdom. And so he turns them loose and nothing happens for like 30 seconds, right? All of a sudden you see a splash. And you see this one guy just giving it all he's got. He gets out on the other side of the water. He's covered in blood and scratches and he's beat up. He's out of breath. And the king says, sir, with a tear in his eye, he says, sir, it was so inspiring. You get the hand of my daughter. He goes, I'd be honored to have you as a son-in-law. And today I'll give you up to half of my kingdom because of the bravery that you exhibited. What could I do for for you. And he looked at him and he said, just tell me who pushed me. <laughs> right? I hope that through my session or through my breakout, maybe one of my areas, you may not want to innovate. You may not have come to want to innovate. You may not want to personalize, but I hope one of the ideas pushes you out. Um, I will also tell you this. Um, my daughter gets paid via follows and mentions on Twitter. I know you only got like two minutes, but if any of you are on Twitter, if five of you say, hey, at Brooke T. Berry, saw what you're doing, proud of you, it will be, I'll be a great daddy, and she will be thrilled. I had to give her a Twitter, Facebook, all the social media at 1201 of her 13th birthday because that's when, that's when it's legal and daddy follows the law, right? And so that was her big birthday gift when she turned 13. I'm at Buddy Berry. Also, I have business cards if you want some. I'm willing to follow up. Where I'm different, I think, than a lot of speakers is I'm boots on the ground. And if you need help, you call me. We'll set up video conferencing. We'll set up phone calls. I will help from this point on if you ask. There's nothing I care more about than the kids of our public education system and personalizing the learning for them, and I will help night or day. Thank you for enduring a tight room and a rough presentation, and so I hope it was at least worthwhile. I hope you all have a great conference, and I hope I get, next year you need to bring Brooke down. Brooke's better than me, so. I need to call her.